Unemployed and Afraid acknowledges the traditional owners of the land we have recorded this episode on and of the land where you, the listener, are tuning in from. We would like to pay our respects to Elders past, present and extend our respect to any First Nations, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today, acknowledging that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Welcome to Unemployed and Afraid a podcast that explores the glorious mess of building brands, businesses, and a career you love with the people who've done it. I'm your host, Kim Curtin. Thank you for being here. Let's get into today's story of starting over. Welcome to the very first Social Stories episode, where each week our community of business builders share stories of key moments and evolutions within their own business building journey. I mean, how good is this? A second weekly episode of the pod, which I have been dying to get to for so long, figuring out what's the right format going to be, what's going to provide value for you, how can I deliver this in in my everyday uh, schedule to make it possible. And here we are, this second weekly episode of the pod, so we can all keep growing together and learning from the chaos each of us experiences on this journey by contributing in and being part of the conversation. I am so bloody excited. So how this works is every week I drop a new question out to the community. I do that through Instagram. I do that through LinkedIn. I do it out to the community of listeners. And I ask for those voice notes to come in in response to that question. I want to hear all about your business experiences, these key moments, these building blocks that keep us going on the journey that we constantly have to build onto and get through to keep going and keep growing. And the first question is, how did you make your first sale? And for you, that might be, how did you find your first customer or your first client if it's not a physical product that you were selling? However, I can't claim this idea. I actually had a message slide into the Unemployed and Afraid Instagram DMs a while back from a wonderful listener giving some really lovely feedback about the podcast and how it was helping them to feel seen and confident to keep pushing in their own business journey. And they suggested I could ask my guests regularly about their first sale. So in each interview, that I do have a regular question that was about their first sale. And and I really liked that. I have started doing that as often as it's appropriate within the conversation, but it's really been the trigger that's built this episode out. So listener, you know who you are. This first episode is for you. And loads of messages have come in. I am so chuffed and have gotten in as many in this episode as I can. And as I said, each week there will be a new question coming out and it's at your opportunity to contribute in it and share your story so that you can also help others feel, feel seen, feel heard, feel confident to keep going and keep growing. So um, even if you've submitted this week, go ahead and submit again, submit as often as you like. Sharing our stories and sharing our experiences is A, what this podcast is all about, but B, it's so important because this business building journey can be really lonely and really challenging and it brings up so much personal challenge as well as the professional challenge. So this sort of sharing is just so important. This sort of vulnerability is just so important so that more of us can keep going and growing and building the thing that we're really passionate about. So that first hurdle, your first sale, your first client, your first customer, it feels like such a big deal. So I will kick off this episode by telling you mine. And I will focus on my ceramics business. So a little while back now, a few years ago, I released my first ceramic pieces for sale. I had been working on them for quite some time, getting them right. I had been slogging over Squarespace, trying to figure out the whole commerce structure, getting PayPal set up, Stripe. If you've been there, you'll know the feels. It really sucks. I felt super organized and really prepared for this. And while I was going through that process, I had focused on building a little bit of an Instagram audience. I used to think that a huge number of followers was the most important thing. But as you go on this journey, you realize it's absolutely got nothing to do with it. It's about engagement. It's about having the right people there. And it's about making them feel happy to be in that space with you and be on your journey. So I had been nurturing that community for quite some time. And so that's where I promoted that I had my pieces for sale. And I did that awkward, anxious thing where I just sort of like waited for something to happen, thinking that something was going to happen really quickly. And naturally, we all know it's not always the case, but maybe it was a distraction technique. I had actually scheduled myself to go somewhere that day. So I had quite a drive ahead of me. I was living in regional Tasmania at the time. And 
I said to my partner, let me drive because it's going to keep me off my phone and, and off looking at it and waiting for a sale to come through to keep me distracted. So I'm um, driving along highway in regional Tasmania and I've got my map set up on the screen so I can see it and I start getting these drop down notifications from Instagram to these DMs coming through. And all I saw were the words, I've tried to buy your ceramics, but the sale won't go through. And my heart just absolutely sunk. I pulled over as calmly as I possibly could. And I had my laptop in the car. So I pulled my laptop out onto, onto my lap, as you do with a laptop, hotspotted my phone, jumped on to try to see what was going on. And the person who sent me that message was the glorious Ingrid Daniel from Wow Song Shack. And I couldn't believe that she was having this experience at Wow Song Shack is a place that I had admired. Ingrid is somebody who I admire greatly. I've had her on this podcast before talking about her business ventures and how she's grown those. So I was devastated realizing that that payment link wasn't working. So I fiddled around. I did some things. I made some, some changes on the back end. I can't even remember what I did. It was just like a haze of chaos. Anyway, Ingrid was able to make that sale and she was my, my first official sale through my ceramics business. And she went on to purchase so many more incredible pieces for her space, Wow Song Shack, and has just been such an amazing support for my work. She's promoted me to her guests. She has uh, told her friends and her colleagues about me and has led to so much more business. So again, I think for me, what I learned about that was it's about finding your people and being patient and letting it roll out. And I think my next like four sales were family and friends. So a big thank you to those guys who pushed me along. And um, I've just loved that ceramics business. Actually, recently, I have just closed it. I have just stopped production of my ceramics because I'm making space for the next business, um, A, being this podcast and um, and another adventure that I'm preparing to go on. So it's quite a fond time to be thinking back to that first sale. Well, I just had my very last sale on Instagram that went bloody mental. So yeah, it's nice to reflect back on that. But look, that sale, that first one, it can come from absolutely anywhere. It is just another one of those mountain faces staring back at you uh, to get that first sale, but then it keeps going and it keeps going. You've got to find the next one. And you've got to keep growing through this process. So the time is now to hear from a few other people about their first sale. Let's kick off with the fabulous Leslie McGill from Little Shove. Hi Kim, it's Leslie from Little Shove. Um, apologies if I've missed your deadline. I couldn't recall what it was, but I thought I'd go ahead and send this to you anyway. So to quickly answer your question about where did my first um, client come from, um, I'm wrapped to say it was actually a former colleague of mine who had seen my announcement on LinkedIn about my new business. Um, and she called me apparently as soon as she'd seen it and asked if I could come in and deliver um, some workshops for her, one of her teams in their Adelaide Oval. So that was enormous for me to have someone from my existing or you know previous professional background see what I was doing, believe in me so much that they reached out immediately and wanted me on board to help them with their team. So yeah, um, amazing start. And, and to be honest, um, a lot of my clients have been through um, former colleagues. So yeah, really exciting. Hope you're well. Bye. Leslie's just been the most fabulous listener and supporter of the show, which I love so much. I mean, I love each of you listening so much. Something that a previous guest, Wade Kingsley, said um, is something along the lines of you already know your first 100 clients, which is why we should never, ever be afraid of putting our business ventures out there no matter how many times those business ventures might start, stop, pivot, change, whatever, put it out to your network. Shout that shit from the rooftops on every single platform that you have in every conversation that you have. It's just so important because you probably already know those people. And I don't just mean friends and family. I mean, you know, colleagues, acquaintances, people that you might not expect. It's just about putting it out there and then being patient enough to let it come in. So love that share from Leslie. The next voice nota is Emily from Hazel Clean. Now, Emily will actually feature on a future episode of the podcast. So I was super excited to get this sneak peek on her story. This is her very first sale. Hey, Kim. So in answer to your question of how I got my first customer, when my partner and I came back from a stint living in the UK and then backpacking um, our way back over to Australia, we very gratefully moved in with my in-laws. And as much as we love them very dearly, it's a bit 
challenging living with your in-laws when you are in an established relationship and, <laughs> and you're in your late uh, mid-twenties. So we were saving, we were wanting to save for a mortgage but didn't want to get stuck in the rent trap. So I came across house sitting and we ended up house sitting for numerous homes in the Hobart area and surrounds for I think it was about 18 months and when we would move into these homes because sometimes it was for a few months at a time um, for me to feel comfortable living in this home I would always clean it from top to toe and organize it within a respectful reason so that we could live in it as I said it was a few months at a time um so once we would finish up a house set we would always leave it absolutely stunning and we built ourselves a really good reputation the reviews that we got from our house sitting jobs were just how clean the homes were how organized they were how how blissful it was to come back after their long trip away to their home which had been so well cared for so after a certain amount of time we were lucky enough to stay for a mortgage um, and at the time I was working in the fitness industry and for those that are in the industry especially in Hobart it's hard to get a full-time gig so you'd be working early mornings late nights and maybe you would get a lunchtime class or a random class in the day and I was working across I think at the time two or three different gyms um, so I was here there and everywhere and I needed something else to fill my day and cleaning always being a passion so I got my very first client so two and I did that by sending an email to all the people that we house sat for over that 18 month period and just said I was starting my own cleaning adventure I'm reaching out to you because you saw firsthand um, the the depth and the high standard of my cleaning along the lines of this this is these are my rates I bring all my own equipment and products do you or do you know anyone who's in search of a domestic cleaner because I will be available from this date and I'll be taking on X amount of clients so that was in 2017 I believe and I got two clients from that or two customers and to this day now in in 2023 they are still my regular clients and um, I cleaned for one of them privately but the other one is now with the team and the and both of them have been with the team along the way so yeah that's how I got my very first customers Okay, firstly, mad respect for the commitment to the clean. That is something I can definitely take on board and might actually be reaching out for your service at some stage. But um, apart from that, I definitely had a quiet little lull, um, as you probably did, about the thought of living back at home as a new couple. That's definitely a feel. But what's so fabulous, I love this about your business, Emily, growing it out of a behavior that we're already doing and then a need to bring in some income and just finding that link point, that tension point and thinking laterally about who could be your customer. It's a real standout for me in your story. I'm sure I've heard this from someone else, so I won't claim that this is uh, my statement, but getting really excited about rejection is just such a great part with business because the more you put yourself out there and the more you get rejected, you're getting closer and closer and closer to the yeses. So it's all about that commitment to the no. Our next voice no dart is Pam from Ocean to Stable. Let's hear about how Pam made her first sale. Tell everybody about your business. That's how I made my first sale. Um, it was about singing from the rooftops the fact that Ocean to Stable was launching. Um, and my first handful of sales in the first month that we were open, and the reality was it was only a handful of sales, um, all came from our family and then colleagues of my husband's work. So the fact we had gone, the fact that he had gone into his office every day saying, my wife is launching a new business please jump online, check it out. He sent um, an email around with a link to our website the day that it launched. Um, and one of our first non-family uh, or friend orders came from that email being a work colleague. I love that reality check on it being a handful of sales. Like even thinking back to my own first sale of my ceramics pieces, like don't know why you, you, you don't actively think this is just me. 
I didn't actively think it's going to be a flood. Like it's going to just come in. But then you, you, you do secretly hope for that. You do secretly hope you're going to be sold out in five minutes. But really what it usually is for, for a lot of people is just a handful and then another handful and then another handful and having that resilience just to kind of keep going with that. But also like just so, so heartening when fr- family and friends get around you and agree, Pam, we've just got to back that in and tell everybody about it. Because, so, you know, thinking back to Leslie as well, it's just, it's probably going to come from, somebody you know our ego can get in the way of that sometimes but it's just another one of those personal development things right it comes right alongside building a business losing any shame in self-promotion and just going for it our next voice noter is kate ferguson aka sticks and stardust and i've seemed to have scheduled these really well because she also knows a little something about putting her work out into the world this is her story Hi, Kim. Thank you so much for letting me be a part of um, the community episodes. I'm so excited. So how I found my first client was, or customer, was they actually found me through Instagram stories. I was just placing some of my artwork up and they found me on there and contacted to purchase through there. Oh, socials. What a great spot for a visual medium. But even if your business isn't visual like Kate's art is, it doesn't matter. Still finding a way to put yourself out there on that platform and maybe a handful of social platforms. It's not about having that huge audience. It's about the engagement and putting yourself out there. I can just imagine that would have felt so unreal seeing that DM just slide on in being like, yeah, I want to buy your stuff. I would have been so excited. Okay, next one we're going to hear from is Karen. She's from C.W. James Jewellery. Here is Karen. Hey, Kim. All right, my first customer was a really supportive friend called Lucy. And she basically what happened was when I was developing the range before I launched, I was designing this bracelet. It was made from quartz stones, handmade, and I wanted it to be easy to put on the wrist. So I made up a sample that had a magnetic clasp and I thought oh this is a great idea you know the clasp is easy to put on and off it's got quite a strong magnet and um, I gave it to my friend Lucy to wear test and I thought this is this is going to work really well I had it already in my mind that this magnetic clasp was going to work really well and Lucy wore tested it and um So Lucy's at the supermarket wearing the bracelet and then the magnet was so strong that it actually she got stuck to the supermarket trolley so she had to sort of kind of like work it off and anyway it was it was not a good idea the magnetic clasp so I ended up working out how to use a new clasp but from wear testing it Lucy really loved the look of that bracelet and when I finally got it right and launched it I wanted to give her the bracelet but she insisted that she didn't want me to give it to her and that she was going to buy it because she saw the value, I guess, that, you know, the heart and soul that went into it. And also, I think she really values like supporting small businesses. So, um, yeah, that was my first customer, an incredibly supportive friend. Okay, so the magnet thing absolutely kills me in your story, Karen. Just like just imagining that is just it's such a funny moment. But I so appreciate the hustle and the test and learn. And it's so nice that your your friend got around it and, and wanted to be your first customer after that. You know, test it, you gotta test, hey, you gotta just put stuff out there and, and see how it goes. I just think that's such a a brilliant way to do it. And like everyone in this episode, I think there's so much more that we could learn from your story. So perhaps we'll have you on a future episode to hear all the ins and outs. Our next guest who wants to share their first sale is going to do so anonymously. And it's a reminder, you are so welcome to do that. You don't have to put your business name. You don't have to put yourself out there in that way if you're not comfortable with it right at this stage of your journey, or it just doesn't feel quite right at this time. But still sharing your story and sharing your experience is such a generous thing to do for other business builders and it's also really nice to reflect on just for yourself to think about how that went so uh, let's hear from our next voice noter 
Hey, Kim, thanks for reaching out. I love this, what, uh, what you're doing. It's so fun. I'm not sure I want my answer this time to be included, but I will say I'm trying to, I was trying to think of my first client or customer. I, um, it was a little squirmy actually, because I was actually feeling, I was in a coach training program and I was feeling, and so I don't know, maybe this is worth including. I was feeling a lot of pressure. Like everyone had their stories of like, and I went to Bed Bath & Beyond on the way home for my first training weekend. And, and the person at the counter totally signed up to be a client. And, and I'm like, oh my gosh, that kind of stuff doesn't happen to me and I'm not going to just randomly strike up conversation at the Bed Bath & Beyond counter. So anyway, I it ended up being a friend of mine, actually. And I just, again, felt all this pressure to, you know, get paid and so had a really uncomfortable, you know, money conversation. So yeah, and I th obviously I have, I have been unraveling money issues and selling issues for years. So not surprising, I guess, that that would be a, a challenge in my in my first client. Um, but so, um, so I guess say the first one was a friend. The second one actually saw an article that I wrote online and reached out to me from all across the world. And that one was easier and actually way more fulfilling. So uh, let's see. Uh, so I'm not sure if this is helpful, but I'm going to pause there and, and you let me know if any of those are helpful. And I hope you have so much fun with these episodes and I look forward to seeing all of your questions. All right. Take care, Kim. Bye. Ah, uh, the money conversation. I mean, how tough can that be sometimes trying to figure out how to price yourself trying to figure out your value and trying to get over your own holdbacks in that money space or the things that are blocking you in that money space I can relate to that so 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 much and I'm sure a lot of you can and it's you know sometimes why that second sale the one that's not a family or a friend or somebody that you know already is actually a lot sweeter because you can come into it with a little bit of confidence and it gives you back a little bit of confidence as well to say, hey, there's somebody out there that is willing to invest in you, is willing to invest in what you're offering. And it just gives you that tiny little bit of motivation to keep going and keep growing. And it's you know probably pretty likely that that price changes over the years, just like all prices change over the years. But I find that as you start to develop your own value set and just really look at yourself in a different way, it, it starts to change and it starts to get a bit easier. So you know, I think that money piece, that, that money vibe, is, um, is a really interesting one. And it's one that I think we're going to talk about a little bit more in future episodes, getting over that money stuff that holds you back. Our next guest uh, is a, has an amazing business. Again, another future guest coming up. I love that our future guests are also getting involved in this show. If you've been a past guest, get involved, drop your story, drop your, your random thoughts, drop your random pieces of advice um, for our future episodes. But these two girls are sisters, Gal and Mayan, and they've got this incredible business that helps women live abroad. So find their way to, to live overseas and feeling more comfortable through the process. Maybe they're already there and needing a little bit of a community. These gals are the ones that are going to make you feel comfortable and make you feel like you're in the right place. Uh, let's hear a little bit from them. Hey Kim, so that's mm -hmm. the story of our first client, this amazing woman that uh, was part of our free sessions that we did for a year every week and she came for about eight months every week uh, trying to deal with a complicated situation which is she lived abroad and just came back home felt a stranger in her own country so she was there every week she's been through an amazing journey with herself every week and every time she came and when we turned those free sessions into our paying membership she was the first one there and she's still with us and we're still seeing her every week and her journey is just amazing I loved hearing this story because it's a reminder that so many things out there tell us as business owners that particularly in a service-based industry that you should offer your service essentially for free to get yourself out there, offer value to an audience to show them what you can do and then look to move them onto a paid service later, which I imagine can feel really scary. And, and the girls talk a little bit about this in their future episode, but it just goes to show that it might not be everyone. It might not be everyone that comes over to you when you move from a free service to a paid service, but those people that are meant to be with you will be with you and they will stay. And I just loved hearing that that person, that first customer that you met in that free forum that you were then able to bring over stayed and continued to get the value. They're the customers that you absolutely want and you want to nurture. Our next guest is the lovely Yoko from Shoko Iku. Let's hear her story. 
Hi, my name is Yoko. I'm a founder of Shokubiku. We are a holistic wellness brand with a vision to elevate people's body and mind through healing, organic living foods, and tonic herbs and adaptogens, steeped in tradition with a modern sensitivity. Before I opened a cafe 10 years ago in Melbourne, I started this business by stocking our raw vegan granola and truffles at retailers. Juggling with a small child at home, I remember going to our local retailer, Whole Food Organics, I think, in Brunswick, to see if they wanted to stock our product, and they became our first customer. It is not easy to push your product and yourself, especially if you are an introvert like myself, but action is what drives your business forward. Oh, just hitting one of my favorite quotes, still sitting on my desk, action creates information, just taking those little steps to keep pushing, just to get yourself out there and, and try zero shame, kill the shame, just put a little bit of action out there and keep going and see where it takes you. Just my favorite piece of advice. Naomi Sherman is our next voice noter, the food whisperer, just making food look, taste and just be a full vibe of amazing. The minute I heard this voice note, I just thought, oh goodness, we could have some fun on the phone together. So let's hear just a little bit about Naomi's story. Hey, gorgeous. All right, I'm doing what I'm told and I'm leaving you my voice message. Uh, depending on what you mean by my first ever client. So my very first ever paying client came to me. She saw my food photos on Instagram and she sent me a message saying, hey, would you like to develop recipes and take photos for my food blog? And I was like, huh, people get paid to do that. Alrighty then. My very first ones that I had like literally pitched myself. So I went and got customers was two different major magazines here in Australia. For each of them, I created a recipe specifically to their genre and included photos in their style and pitched that I would like to be one of their content creators. And I still am to this day. So there's my two stories. I just love that vibe. People get paid for this. Like how great to organically grow a business in that way, just to, to put stuff out there and go like, hang on a minute. I can actually make something of this and then just keep pulling the thread, pulling the thread and just following it along and seeing where it leads. If you check out Naomi's page, you'll see just how incredible her work is. And, you know, imagining how much she's grown from that first customer and seeing what she's, she's doing now. It's just, if you don't take that first step, you just never know. You can just put some stuff out there without the expectation and see what comes through. So yes, legit Naomi, I would definitely pay you for that because you've got one hell of a talent. Our next guest is our second to last actually. So our next guest is Jade Bell. If you listen to an episode from a few weeks back, I mean, depending what time you're listening to this, of course, it could be quite some weeks back, but I interviewed an incredible woman, Laura Elizabeth, and she has a business called Maven Press. And how I found out about her was the incredible Jade Bell. Jade and I studied together in creative writing and just had a vibe. It's one of those internet vibes where we needed to edit each other's work and we just really got each other and we were just really supportive and helping each other grow pretty brutal, both of us in our feedback side to side. And it was just some of the best growth that I've ever had in my writing. And I just knew from reading Jade's work that she was just going to be just incredible. And we're going to see her name in lights for, for years to come. She's got an incredible talent, but Jade is now partnered with Laura Elizabeth, which is the point of me bringing that up. And uh, so she shared in her story about how that came about. So my first customer came about because I was doing a publishing and editing professional writing degree, as you know, Kim, because you were there with me. And a friend asked if anybody would like to edit something for her. I put my hand up, I did it. Um, she loved the editing, she owns Maven Press. And over the course of the next six months, I was absolutely terrified to ask her for more editing work. But I ended up doing it and she said, yeah, we have a book coming up. Um, the current editor was away, so I took the job on. And now we're, what, eight months in and six books down. And I'm the chief editor for Maven Press. And I absolutely love my job. I get to, to help women and men have a platform for their voice. And we release some amazing books. Um, yeah, and I'm really privileged. So how I got my first client was I asked for it. <laughs> and here we are. 
Yes, Jade, I love it. You've got to ask for this stuff. You've just got to ask. You just never know. You've got to put yourself out there as often as you can. Ask everyone, embrace those no's because you're probably also going to get a yes. So yeah, I just love this story so much. And, and Jade, I'm just so excited to continue watching. Our last guest joins us from New York City, which makes my heart hurt just a little bit thinking about where she is in the world. Who doesn't just love that city? This story of resilience, when I heard it for the first time, I was just like, yes, this, yes, it's all about this sort of hustle and this sort of confidence that what you have to offer is valuable and will find its place and will find its audience. So let's hear this story. My name is Alexis and my work is focused on how to help people live their lives with greater ease and peace. I'm a mindfulness program creator and I create wellness initiatives for organizations. I've taught mindfulness at startups, corporate enterprises, and nonprofits. I've also guided retreats internationally and in the DEI space. Please feel free to check me out at wellness to the people.com so how i got my first client was i basically created a list of nonprofits and companies that i wanted to create a mindfulness program for and initially i was cold calling a lot of these places and oftentimes i would leave a voicemail or someone would answer and say that they would take a message and i realized early on in that cold calling process that I would rarely get callbacks and there was a lot of sort of like gatekeeping and it was really hard to reach decision makers. So then I decided to go in person and I found it to be a lot easier to get an answer sooner. So I would often get a no on the spot. It was more rejection and, you know, dealing with rejection in person is pretty challenging, especially when you're first starting off. But I think it was really important to help me redirect my efforts towards the yeses. And I think that going in person really helped for the type of business that I have and sort of bypassing all of the gatekeeping that I felt was happening with cold calling. I finally got my first client after going to many locations and many companies and nonprofits for maybe about a month I was going in person to these places and it was with a nonprofit and I'd left my resume with the person who runs the wellness program there and then we continued to communicate via email back and forth and she was very interested but there were some levels of approval that she needed and about three months into the back and forth emails I was starting to kind of lose hope that it was ever going to come to fruition and I actually stopped following up with this person I think about four months into the back and forth because um there was just a lot of hold up on her end and I and I figured I just didn't want to continue to push it if maybe it wasn't feasible. And then almost eight months later, she reaches back out and she says she's ready to start the program and if I can start in the next two weeks. I think overall what I learned from the process is that the sooner you can get in front of a client, the better. And you could either get your no faster or you can get a yes. And then I also learned that it takes time. I actually just recently acquired a corporate client, which is really exciting. And that was also about a year of conversation um, on and off. So I think being patient is another aspect of the process that is really helpful to keep in mind. Finding your first customer, your first client, your first sale is always going to be different for everybody. And, you know, we hope that it's going to be just incredible and it's going to kick off straight away and it's going to go crazy. And for a lot of businesses, that does happen, but not every single business. 
But if it's something that you believe in, you've just got to keep trying and keep pushing and just give it a little bit of a go. Put yourself out there, see what comes back with no expectation. Start embracing those rejections. No matter what stage you're at in business, whether it's your first sale or your 50th or your 2000th sale, if that's a way to say it, no matter where you're at in this journey, such a big part of that is hearing the stories of others, connecting with the stories of others and sharing it with other people as well. Community in business building is just so important. So I hope you've gotten a little bit of value from today's episode. I would love to hear what you think as we continue on this journey together, growing this second episode, growing this community. If you're not already, make sure you're following Unemployed and Afraid on Instagram at Unemployed and Afraid. Same for LinkedIn. Follow us over there. You can connect with me on LinkedIn as well. Kim Curtin, same on the socials on IG, uh, good side of the bed. You can find me there. Also, we have a Facebook group. So this is a private group. Please find us on Facebook at Unemployed and Afraid and ask to join. I'll be dropping some questions in there as well in future weeks and just creating more of an environment so that we can start to share, start to build a little bit of a community so that we can all feel a little bit more seen on this journey that can be really scary, that can feel really lonely and it doesn't have to be. And you've got it in you to grow whatever it is you want to do, no matter where you're at with your business, just starting or scaling up into epic territories. It's all about making sure that you feel supported on this journey so that you can keep going. So thank you for joining me on this episode today. If you loved it, leave a review, drop a star rating on whatever platform you're doing, write a little comment for the reviews. I just love those. You know how much I love those. And give me your feedback on the socials. What do you want to hear more of? What questions do you want answered? What do you want to hear about what's challenging you in your business right now? This episode is for you. This podcast is for you. So get in touch, get around it. And I look forward to being in your ears again very soon. Thank you for listening to Unemployed and Afraid, the stories of starting over with your host, me, Kim Curtin. If you love it, you can say thanks with a star rating and a review. And of course, join the community on Instagram and LinkedIn. Find us at Unemployed and Afraid. See you there.